So we've been going through a series on the minor prophets called Majoring in the Minors. And we're hitting that point, uh, or we may already have hit it depending on where you come from, where you're like, is that really in the Bible? Is that, is that name Zephaniah really something that's in the, in, the, in the scriptures? Because we don't often hear some of these, some of these prophets. And so they can be a little unfamiliar. Um, as I was going through uh, memory verses this week, some memory verses of the past that I've memorized over the last 10 or 15 years, I came across Zephaniah 3, uh, 17. And I'm like, I don't remember memorizing that passage. Apparently I didn't memorize it very good because I don't remember it. But I did at some point. But it, it kind of highlights sometimes how the minor prophets, some of the minor prophets, we don't always recognize. We, we, we may have read them at some point in, in life and have forgotten about them or, um, or have never read them in all of our life. And this series has is, is, is been designed to, to hopefully highlight parts and pieces of each of the minor prophets. And so this week, we are in Zephaniah. So if you'll pray with me, we'll jump right in. Lord, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to your word. That this word that some commentators call the gospel, the John 3.16 of, of the Old Testament, Lord, that you would sink it deep into our hearts, that you would make it real for us, Lord. Help us not to just hear the words and let them bounce off, but help them sink deep. Lord, we, we ask for your help. In this, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So about a year ago or more, I found myself doing something that I swore that I would never do. I found myself giving directions to somebody in the way that I used to hear old people give directions to people when I was a kid. And it would go something like this. Somebody would ask the question, hey, do you know the best way to get to the river? And the person that I would hear give the directions would say, sure, sure. Yeah, you just go down that, that little road and, until you come to the, the big hill. And now, now, there's three hills in a row, and you don't want to take the right at the little hill, which is the first hill. You want to take the right at the second hill, which is the big hill. And, and there's a lady that lives on that corner who has chickens, and, but she doesn't keep them in a coop, so they, they, you know, they, they walk all over the place. So you've got to be careful so you don't run over her chickens. But when you see the chickens, you'll know you're in the right place. You'll take a right. You'll go down the road about a mile. And then you'll see a, a waterfall coming out of the rock of the big hill. And, except it used to free flow, but the state put a pipe in there a few years ago so that the water would flow out and people who live down the holler who don't have running water can come up here and get, get water for their household. When, when you see that, you'll know that you're close to where you need to turn. So slow down and you're going, to, you're going to drive underneath the train trussle that, well, the trains don't run on it anymore. They stopped that years ago. But it's, it's still there and there's, it's actually a walking trail there now. And, and when you go underneath it, you'll know that you're close. And, and, and it's a left. It'll be coming up and, and it's kind of hidden. So if you're not real careful, you'll go right by it. But if you're driving slow enough after you come under that trussle, you'll see it. You'll take a left and there's the river. And, and as a kid, I'm like, how does anybody find anything? with directions like that and so about a year ago I was standing on the street in the neighborhood and somebody pulled up to me and I, I'm not this is they said hey what's the best way to get to St. John Cantus Catholic Church and I said well <laughs> do a u-turn right here and you're gonna see two restaurants one restaurant does uh, upscale seafood the other restaurant does a modern American, you're going to want to go right through the middle of those two restaurants, and you want to go real slow because you're going to come up on these new condos. They look kind of like boxes stacked on top of each other. There used to be a gas station there, but that gas station hasn't been operational for years, and, and a developer bought that, and you should have seen the money they spent to have those old gas tanks removed. It was really crazy, but it's not there anymore. Just look for the condos. They're on your right, and you'll be at an intersection. And the intersection is a little weird because the road kind of curves a little bit. And, but you, you want to just go straight through, and you know you're in the right place because there's a building that used to be a bank and a, and a modern sculpture on the left. People hate that modern sculpture. Some people like it, but some people hate it. 
And you get my point. And the people, as I explained the directions, the people, their eyes just kind of glazed over. <laughs> and they held out their phone and they said, this is what my GPS says. Is this the right way? And I looked at it and I said, yeah, that's the right way. So I start that way to say that sometimes the prophecy that we read in the Old Testament feels kind of like the directions that we get when we ask somebody how to get someplace. There's a destination, a, a, a really good destination, and there are things along the way that help us on our way to the destination, but sometimes it almost is too much information, and we kind of just tune it out. And I'm hoping that you'll see today that that's, that's a really a big mistake it's, it's sometimes it's unavoidable but it's a big mistake and I hope that you will you will see uh, the destination for sure today but some of the points along the way to get to the destination and, and how that helps us how it gives us hope and how it keeps us from being being distracted by other things that maybe take us away from what the destination is and so the first thing is the destination the the picture that this prophecy paints of where we are heading. And I want to quickly summarize the picture uh, of this prophecy. And, and in order to do that, I have to deal with some of the context of the prophecy in the first place. So Zephaniah prophesied during the, the reign of Josiah, King Josiah. And uh, we, we learn that right at the very beginning of Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 1. That he, he descends from a, 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 probably the royal line. And he's prophesying during the time of Josiah, King Josiah. And if you know anything about King Josiah, that was a time for reform, religious reform in, in Judah. And that there was a time when, when the people of God were returning to God. That they were, they were trying to seek him again. Uh, and that at least some were trying to seek him again. And, and there was a time of maybe a little bit of prosperity. It wasn't a whole lot because Assyria had, uh, as Mark shared last week, had begun to lose their dominance uh, years before and they and some of their grip was slipping and so Judah was able to maybe to gain a little more wealth they weren't paying as much tribute some of the other surrounding countries weren't as well and they were they were beginning to break away from this oppression that they'd felt in the past but God has a lot to say even though the outlook looks so bright for Judah God has a lot to say about that through Zephaniah. Because chapters 1 and 2 of this three-chapter book are prophecies of judgment. There's this time coming that God says he will judge the nations. He will judge the nations who have hurt and oppressed God's people, but also God will judge his people as well. And when God visits the judgment on his own people, it's a very bleak picture of the future ahead for his people. But then we get to chapter 3, and chapter 3 is almost the exact opposite. Actually, so much so that a lot of scholars say that chapter 3 was added later, which is which bunk. They were written together. But it's so, so desperately different from chapters 1 and 2 it's, it's so starkly contrasted to the judgment that we see in, ch in chapters 1 and 2. It's this beautiful picture of hope and blessing. It's a picture that stands on the other side of suffering and shame and pain. It's a time when God's people will rejoice with all of their heart, hearts. And this hope, this hope that the picture is painted is one where sins are forgiven and punishment is removed in verses 15 and 17. They won't have to fear harm anymore because the Lord will protect them in verse 15. And the Lord will be with his people in 15 and 17. And he will love his people as he is with them and sing praises over them in verse 17. And he will enact just, justice and judgment. Those who have oppressed his people and hurt his people will pay. That's verse 19. And those who have been hurt and oppressed, who have not had voices, who have been ashamed and, and shamed, 
will find honor and praise and restitution. And that's verse 19 and 20. It's a picture that almost, it defies words because it's so perfect. It's really hard to imagine. And the, and the prophet Zephaniah, he's, he's employing all of his, his skills to paint this beautiful picture of goodness. Think of that most perfect moment in your life. That time when things were almost exquisitely perfect. Think about that, that moment. Now multiply that by a billion. That's the picture that Zephaniah is trying to paint for us this morning. That's the goal. That's the destination. That's the hope that is promised for God's people. And it isn't a promise for everyone. It's a promise for those who are God's people, his faithful ones, the ones who trust him. Zephaniah calls them the remnant earlier in chapter 3, verse 12. And that's the picture that he paints. And it matters for two reasons. It gives us hope along the way, and it keeps us on track when we might get distracted. God's people are going to face hardship. Zephaniah has told them that they will. And this plays out in just a generation Jerusalem is crushed by Babylon. The temple is destroyed. The people are carried away to live in a foreign land. God's people face hardship in the way that they haven't. They feel the weight of punishment, and it's crushing. No more temple worship. The very thing that marked God's presence with his people, the temple is gone, destroyed. No worship of God in Jerusalem. No praise of God on Mount Zion. But the word Zephaniah has for God's people is that they will make it through. That there will be a group who are, are carried through it all. That God will see them and care for them. And that he loves them, in fact. And that he will protect them and guide them through it all. And they will come through it on the other side. The bad guys, the ones who hurt them, will pay. And everything will be made right. Mark said last week that one of the things we, we can do to help us to be faithful today is to look at the things that God has done in the past. And this is one of those pictures. God, no matter what, has always worked to see his people carried through hard and impossible times. And so this prophecy is a promise of restoration in the future. It gives hope to God's people. And we can see that God does this. Even through the Babylonian captivity, God is faithful to his people. They are cared for. They actually even thrive. They are brought home with Cyrus. They begin to rebuild the temple. A remnant of God's people blessed to return to Jerusalem. They lay the foundation of a new temple. God protects them. The appointed festivals can be renewed. The Lord God is with his people again. His mighty hand watches over them. And they can rejoice. And it seems that this prophecy is coming true then and there. But there's this place in Ezra. Ezra chapter 3. That we see when the builders laid the foundation of the temple to the Lord as they're, they're back in Jerusalem, the priests in their vestments and with their trumpets, and the Levites, this is from Ezra 3, with symbols took to their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. One group of people rejoice and give praise. Another group mourns and cries out because the glory of God's temple doesn't come close 
to matching that of what they had remembered. This cannot be the fulfillment of Zephaniah. And so on that day, the prophecy is not fully fulfilled. But God is still with them, still carrying them through. And they can see his faithfulness to give them hope. They get to see hints of it. Bits and pieces. Glimpse of what could be. But they shouldn't make of the mistake of the, the laying of the foundation for what will be. It should keep them looking for something more. If we fast forward several hundred years from that time, we do find another oppressor. Rome. The people are suffering and under the control of another foreign power. They long for help. They cry out for help. And Jesus is born. Not just a man, but God himself who joins them. John is very clear in drawing that connection so it's not missed in his gospel. He says in chapter 1 that God made his dwelling among us. The word made his dwelling among us. His mighty hand is present to save. Jesus is born. Emmanuel, God with us. The true king. When Philip and Nathaniel uh, meet Jesus, they recognize what is happening in John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and he told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite, in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You still see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. They get what's happening. They see what's happening. That, that Jesus is the king. That the king is here. And we begin to see the picture of hope that Zephaniah has painted in his prophecy as Jesus speaks of the kingdom that is coming. This amazing kingdom in which God rules. It is a kingdom where the poor in spirit will find the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn will be comforted. The meek will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. The merciful will be shown mercy. The pure in heart will see God. The peacemakers will be called children of God. Those who are persecuted because of righteousness will find that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And those who are insulted and persecuted because of Jesus will be blessed. This is the kingdom that Jesus preaches. A kingdom where the lonely find family. Where the hurting and suffering find hope and healing. The poor, the oppressed, the suffering, and the shamed all find an end to that in Jesus Christ. And the truth of what he preaches is proven with acts of power and wonder in his ministry there's this one particular place where peter james and john are witness to the glory of who jesus is and and it makes them want to kind of stay and settle down when when jesus goes up on the mount to be transfigured and 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 peter and james and john are with him in matthew 17 and he goes up onto a mountain and he's transfigured and god's voice says this is my son and peter's like this is it this is the this is the, he doesn't say those words, so I'm putting words in Peter's mouth. He says, this is Zephaniah's prophecy. Come, let's, let's build shelters and stay here and settle, do settle down. And, 
Jesus knows that there is more. That it isn't the full, full fulfillment. Because there's more. He is fulfilling this prophecy, but he also must suffer. It looks different than what people expect. They think Jesus is the king, and that he will rule in the way that all other kings have ruled. They think that he will end Rome's rule. And Jesus comes into Jerusalem praised as the king who will save, but in just a few short days, he's arrested and hung on the cross to die. And as Jesus hangs on the cross, people pass by Jesus and they insult him. And they say, if you are the son of God, save yourself. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders, the rulers, they, they look at Jesus and they mock him. And they say this, this is in Matthew 27, 42. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. See, they didn't understand that in the cross, Zephaniah's prophecy is coming true. This prophecy is being fulfilled. The Lord has taken away the punishment of his people. He's taken away yours. He's taken away mine. Another prophet, Isaiah, says that our sins, our iniquities, are on his shoulders. In the cross is where God takes our sin. All the things we've done wrong that deserve punishment, judgment, wrath, he takes away. In Christ, we are no longer rebuked. In Christ, God can sing over us. And he gathers not just Israel, but people from every nation. And he gives them a home with him. God loves the world so much that he sent his son to die so that we would find life with him. And there's so much hope in that prophecy. So much hope in that promise. But that still isn't the final fulfillment of this prophecy. That still isn't the end of this prophecy. It's a, it's a, a post along the way. Because the ultimate picture that Zephaniah paints for us is one that is so much more powerful. The kingdom that Jesus ushers in as he's teaching on the, the, the Beatitudes and as he's hanging on the cross, the kingdom that Jesus ushers in finds final fulfillment at the end of all time. The day of the Lord's coming. See, Zephaniah 3 finds fulfillment in Jesus, but there's still pain and suffering in the world. There's still heartache. Our souls still long for something more. Every single day, my heart cries out for something more than what I find around me. There's something more beyond us, something better, and we know it. We, we can just maybe try to grasp it, and we, we seek after it, and we pursue it. We know that there's more. We know that that what is around us falls short and could be better. And that thing that we know, it, it's, it's coming. The final fulfillment of this prophecy is coming. One of the most graphic pictures of that day is in Zephaniah in chapter 1. And I want to just kind of read what Zephaniah starts off with. He says, The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. Listen, the cry on the day of the Lord will be bitter, 
the shouting of the warrior there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. I will bring distress, this is God speaking, I will bring distress on the people and they will walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like filth. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole world will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. That picture is contrasted with the picture in chapter 3. There will come a time when we will reach our destination. Fully and finally, we will find rest and praise and God's glory fully among us. And it will bring terror for God's enemies and praise from God's people. God will be with us forever. The justice we long for, the hope that we hold on to in the, in the midst of, of pain and suffering, all that has ever been wrong will be undone and made right. And it'll, it'll appear just as a little blip on the radar of history. And that should give us hope. God has shown us his faithfulness. His promises are good and true. And he will make things right no matter what we go through today. And yet we still so often pursue things that dull the pain and the anguish we feel. We, we know there's something more. We know it's there, yet we grasp at other things. We want security, so we push ourselves to gain money and power and prestige in ways that are wrong. We feel pain, so we dull it with drugs and alcohol. We experience shame, so we blame others. For what is wrong in the world, hoping to gain some of our honor. We are hurting, so we hurt others. We pursue the wrong things. We mistake the momentary pleasures of this world for the eternity of peace and honor that is found only in Jesus. And all along he is there. He is our hope. He is our destination. All the hope we've ever had for something better is found in Him. All the desires that we've ever had, ever will have, will be found in Him. And one day, as John tells us in Revelation, we will find that God's dwelling place will finally and forever be with His people. And every wrong thing, every pain, every evil will be undone forever. And we will not fear, and we will not hurt. And there will be no more tears. And that's our destination in Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Lord, help us to focus on that. Not get caught up in all the things that are around us that confuse us or distract us, Lord. Help us to, just to keep that destination in mind, Lord be faithful, to walk faithfully, to serve you always. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.